All right, we've got our next session for a more local perspective. It's called The View from Maryland Counties. We have an illustrious panel and a very illustrious and tall moderator. <laughs> Uh, who I'll, let, I'll read off the names that we'll, that we'll uh, welcome them on stage. The moderator is uh, well-known Mark Funkhauser, who's a publisher of Governing and the former mayor of Kansas City, Missouri. The panelists are the Honorable Rashern Baker III, County Executive with Prince George's County. The Honorable Matthew Holloway, President of Wacomico County Council. Michael Sanderson, Executive Director of the Maryland Counties Association and the Honorable Blaine Young, President of the Frederick County Board of Commissioners. Let's give them a warm welcome. I'm not in Annapolis. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, at our inaugural uh, Maryland Leadership Forum. Uh, typically, we start these, as we did this morning, with a view of where things are going in the state from the point of view of the leadership of state government. Then we turn and we say, okay, so that's what the state government says about where, for example, Maryland is going. What about local governments, in this case, the Maryland counties? How do things look from the point of view of the Maryland counties? So what we're going to do, I'm going to ask questions, they're going to give short, snappy answers, <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to turn to you, and uh, I'm going to get your perspective on what they've said, on what Lieutenant Governor Brown said, and where you think Maryland is going. So, your perspective on, on um, Maryland. And I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, the, the Honorable Rashern Baker, uh, County Executive of Prince George's County. First of all, uh, welcome to uh, Prince George's County. We're glad to have Governing a Magazine here and having this program. Um, you know, I, I have to say, me, the, the almost four years I've been county executive, um, the working relationship with the governor and lieutenant governor has been, has been great. We haven't asked for much, so we've been very quiet. <laughs> and we didn't want anything like changing the governance structure of education or or a destination resort in the southern part of the county, or money for a new hospital. So we didn't ask for much. So, you know, the working relationship was great. It was easy. I think they loved working with me. Uh, but on a serious note, um, it has been really good for us. You look at where we were when I came in and um, where we are now, especially in terms of development. Um, it has is, it is really worked well for us. The Honorable Matthew Holloway. Sure. President of Wacomico County Council. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having me today. Um, you know, where Maryland is now and, and where are we going? Um, right now we've, we've been through a period of uh, where the state really has been withholding funding from us and uh, passing down expenses to us. Um, disparity funding and uh, how we use the revenues have evaporated. Uh, the tax assessment office was passed down to us. Uh, the teacher pensions were passed down as well. And uh, especially for a rural county like Wicomico County, um, that, that burden is extremely hard to bear. Uh, there's also been new mandates that are passed down. The septic bill was passed down, which, uh, you know, in a rural county affects our property values. Uh, the WIP is coming down to us. Uh, that's something that every county is facing. Um, also, the zero waste initiative. Uh, you know, we are a landfilling operation, as are many of the counties around us. And... Uh, you know, we have to address that and see, really go a new direction to see how we're going to address that. Uh, and then the phosphorus management tool uh, for a number one ag county in the uh, state, phosphorus management tool could prove to be devastating to our local economy. So where is it going? And, and what I'm really hoping is that we see a restoration of some of this funding. Uh, I know it's not going to be immediate, um, but hopefully we work towards that. Um, Hopefully we can take advantage of the new initiative that was passed down by the Lieutenant Governor and Governor, the IRR, the Infill Revitalization and Redevelopment. Um, I'm the new Ag representative on the Sustainable Growth Commission, so uh, hopefully I can bring the rural perspective to this uh, commission and, and hope, help to focus this IRR, not only in the uh, Baltimore City, but, but hopefully some of the uh, more rural municipalities as well. And uh, really the state, what would be helpful is if the state recognizes that 
we need to address issues on a regional scale. Uh, a lot of these issues, like the uh, WIP, uh, need to be addressed uh, multi-jurisdictionally, not just uh, by the boundaries of Wicomico County. So. Very good. Uh, the Honorable Blaine and the Honor, President of Frederick County Board of Commissioners. Um, the piggyback on uh, many things uh, that were just uh, presented, uh, we're just really looking for predictability and stability at this point. I think we're all hoping that uh, the economy has rebounded, uh, that we see job growth, that we see expansion, expansion and accessible tax base. Uh, we are growing in Frederick County. Uh, we're the eighth largest county, largest landmass county, about 240,000 residents. We have about 1,100 uh, permits, uh, housing permits uh, this year for building permits. So, uh, you know, things are going well. Uh, our unemployment in Frederick County is in, uh, low 5%. It actually went under 5% uh, in December, 4.8. So at this point, we realized that the, the state had a, a heavy agenda. Uh, there was some things called cramming down, and a lot of states across the, uh, this great nation did that, and uh, we've dealt with it. Um, uh, we've reached out to our, uh, our business community uh, and say, what can we do to be more business friendly? Uh, because obviously those that are there, we want them to uh, remain viable. Uh, obviously, we want people to relocate to Frederick County and uh, expand in Frederick County. So uh, just as a business looks for predictability and stability, as a county, we're looking for the same thing from the state uh, at this juncture, as I believe we all hope uh, that the economy is on the rebound. And Michael Sanderson, Executive Director of the Maryland Counties Association. Well, thank you all very much uh, for having me this morning. I, my fellow panelists have talked from the perspective of managing and, and, and governing county governments. Uh, our organization works with the counties, but has our, our feet in Annapolis at the state level. And I want to say something a little different than my fellow panelists. So I'll say Maryland's not unique coming out of a tough economy and having to have made some difficult choices, fiscally and otherwise. I think for counties, we have an awful lot of skin in the game as to what the next step is going to be. Uh, you have to peel back, you have to cut back, you have to realign the budget to get out of a tough time. That's the nature of government revenues and the budget cycle. Uh, what do you do next? And from the county government perspective, I think there's a really interesting question of political philosophy for Maryland for the next five, ten years. And that is, what's the role of the state going to be in providing services that largely come through the county governments, through local governments. Uh, we've seen, as you've heard, you've heard from my fellow panelists, we've seen the state say we can't do as much in transportation. We've seen the, sta the state say in a lot of areas with our local jails and our health departments and our police departments that the broad-based state contribution can't and won't be what it used to be. So what's the state role going to be? Is the state going to be just an actor that fills in for equity purposes, steps in on education and says, we have to meet goals in education, so we're going to do some wealth equalized, um, you know, unbalanced formulas to make sure education all reaches a certain level? Or are we going to see the state stay on the path it had been on, saying there are a lot of functions delivered locally that we need to make sure there are resources to do? Your lo local law enforcement, public health, um, you know, paving the roads, all those sorts of things that are administered locally, does the state have a stake in seeing those happen? Or is that just going to be a matter of the local governments, you come up with whatever resources your politics and your electorate can handle, and you do that primarily locally? Those are, it's, it's sort of a, it's a, a two roads diverge in the woods here. And some of the tough decisions are during the tough economy. There's another round of them that happen afterwards. So that's a very good sort of transition to my next question for each of you. Um, and, and we'll start with you, uh, Mr. Baker. Um, but how can the state work better with counties? Well, I think, um, you know, what was said by um, my colleagues up here is exactly it. I mean, from, it's interesting. I went from the legislative body to the executive body. And there's a big difference when you pass laws and you send them down to the local level and you say, great, we passed this, implement it, but there's no funding along with it. Um, I think the way to work, and with the way we've tried in, in, in Prince George's County uh, to work with the state, and I think this is the model, is find those areas where we need their help, 
basically not only just policy wise but also financially <clears throat> so you take something like education where we wanted to change the structure of how education is done in Prince George's County but along with that we needed additional funding uh, for K through 12 uh, and pre-k uh, education so there's a nex uh, uh, nexus with the state helping us with policy and with dollars and I think that's uh, uh, economic development we announced, and the lieutenant governor was there, that we're going to bring a state agency to Prince George's County. It's, we've never had one before. So it's not just bringing a facility to the county. It's allowing us to use that as a catalyst for economic development and growing our tax base so we can fund the programs we want. I think those are the ways that, um, that we can work together. Where we have to be careful at the, at the state level and the local, local level is uh, teacher pension. When I came in, we had a huge budget deficit. The last thing I could afford is having more of that, of what was, uh, used to be uh, funded by the state pushed down on us without having the ability to raise revenues in Prince George's County to deal with it. So I think those are the things we're going to continue to go back and forth over the years. Mr. Oliver. Yeah. Um, you know, my main thought on how the state could help is uh, really the state, as I said before, the state needs to recognize that we, especially in the rural counties, need to address things on a, a regional scale. Uh, and take the WIP, for instance. Um, our, our thought is that we need to tackle this on the watershed basis, not based on geographic, or based on geographic boundaries, not political boundaries. Um, it's no sense in Wicomico County uh, doing their part to clean up part of the Nanticoke River when, uh, if Dorchester County is not on the same page and tackling it the same way. Uh, we have three rivers within our county that, that we, and two of them we share geogra or political boundaries with. So we need to uh, have the state allow us to address it on watershed basis. Um, also, really the state, the best thing that would help us is the state recognizes how fragile our economy still is. Um, a lot of people talk about recovery. We haven't recovered. We're stable. Uh, but we have not started to recover. Um, we need to, they also need to recognize how much impact these state actions have, such as the phosphorus management tool and the chicken tax that was talked about during the session. Um, number one ag economy and also chickens are our number one business. Um, that could be an extreme uh, detriment to us. So just, just having that conversation is, is not helpful to our, to our economy. All right. Mr. Young. Well, I mean, we are one Maryland, but I would... Uh, hope that the state would recognize that with certain policy that one, one, one size fits all approach does not work for every single county. Uh, our state is very diverse. Agriculture is our number one industry also. So we face many of the challenges uh, that Matt just, uh, just mentioned. So uh, you know, just to make sure that, that we do have a real seat at the table, our voices are truly being heard. Uh, a lot of the rural counties, you know, Freddie County is, you know, unique. I mean, one minute we can be Western Maryland when it's appropriate. The next minute we're Central Maryland when it's appropriate. <laughs> so it depends on it, what It's table. amazing how a county can move like that. It depends which table we're at. So, uh, um, you know, we do have the second largest uh, city in the state of Maryland, the city of Frederick, in our, our boundaries. Uh, we did uh, band together a lot of the rural counties with the Rural Counties Coalition uh, to deal with with a lot of things that uh, Matt just mentioned. Again, it gets back to predictability and stability. Uh, if, we, if we know exactly what is going to occur at the state level uh, with that being predictable, with that predictability and stability, it would help uh, all counties plan uh, for their long-term goals, future, and success. Well, Mr. Sanderson, you work with both the rural and the urban counties and, and those that are in between, including the ones that sort of move back and forth. Uh, and, and so what, what, what do you think the state can do better to work with counties? I think actually just hearing three diverse jurisdictions talk about from this different perspective uh, and, and their different views uh, gives you a sense that part of what we need to hope for is that this is cyclical. That a tough economy and tough decisions of the last five, six, seven years have been thrust upon us and that the rising tide can lift all these boats. Uh, that the tough relationship between state and its local governments uh, was a necessary difficulty, but the next cycle 
we can rebuild, we can have state leaders recognize the great potential there is in each of these counties, rural, urban, transitional, and, and recognize that working together is the way for our economy, for our public services, and for our citizens to all thrive. And I think, I think we get that mindset at both the state and county level. Um, it's a platitude, but I think that's really the right path for everybody. So I got one last question, and you'll be thinking of yours, because <laughs> after this one, I, I'm turning to you. And that is, give us an example of something in Maryland, from your point of view, that is working really, really well. Mr. Baker, what's working well? Um, in, in terms of the relationship between the, count, the county Any government... Any way you want to frame it. What you're doing well in your county, what, any way oh, you want to frame it. Oh, everything is an election year. <laughs> everything, everything is great in now, Prince George's now, County. I, I think a place where, I'll give you two examples if I, if I can, they'll be quick. Um, one is public safety. I think our, the relationship between uh, at least Prince George's County and I would say Montgomery County, if they were here because we work with Montgomery County, but working with the governor and lieutenant governors, office and public safety in Prince George's County has reduced crime to record levels in the county. Uh, it's so much so that uh, during uh, two years ago we cut homicides by 33 percent, one of the largest numbers in the entire nation. And that was the joint working together. So I think that. And economic development. A lot of the uh, policies around growing the economy that you see now and taking advantage of the fact that we have these metro sites in Prince George's County is based on and honestly, uh, the policies that have carried through from Glo Governor Glenn Denning's uh, smart growth. But we're working with the state to do that, and I think that's working really well. Mr. Holloway, what's working well? Uh, one thing that worked extremely well in our county uh, was a roundtable that was actually set up by Rick Pollitt, our county executive, on the septic bill. Um, we, we had been going back and forth for probably six months at least on uh, what a tier map was going to look like uh, for our county. And um, while we're still not there yet, what, what Rick did was he got all the interested parties at the table through uh, the Boschman Center for Conflict Resolution at SU. Uh, we had Chesapeake Bay Foundation there. We had property owners. We had politicians. We had uh, people from all, all um, different areas of this, of this debate. And uh, what came out of that wasn't a map but it was an idea of the direction we want to head. And uh, it, was, it had buy-in from all of those parties. And that was something that um, I really am proud that I was a part of. It was a two-night event. We got people there from, uh, I believe it was 5 o'clock until, was it 5 till 9 um, for two nights in a row. Um, if you can get people committed to four hours, two nights in a row, they're, they're committed to the process. And uh, so we're, we're really looking forward to using that same philosophy for some other issues that we have coming up. Tell me again the name of the organization that helped you with that. That was the uh, Bosserman Center for Conflict Resolution out of Salisbury University. Very cool. Very yep. cool. Mr. Young, what's working well? Uh, just quality of life. I, I couldn't imagine of living in any other state. I think Maryland's the best state. We have our differences. We have our disagreements. Uh, Frederick County, I can get to West Virginia in 25 minutes. I can look at the roads. I look at the schools. I look at the parks. I don't want to live in West Virginia. I go to Virginia, look the same thing. I don't want to live in Virginia. I don't want to live in Pennsylvania, which neighbors our county. Now, I think that uh, those states do have stories to tell about being uh, pro-business and things of that nature. But I'm a lifelong resident of Frederick County. I think my county is the best. Uh, but just like I tell uh, people in Frederick County, there's not one elementary school, middle school, or high school that I want to be proud to send my kids to. Uh, I'm proud of Maryland. I'm proud of every county that's in Maryland, and I couldn't imagine any other place to live except Maryland. And I think that uh, with the proximity of where we are, that is one of the, the best assets that Maryland has. I can go to, uh, to Garrett County to ski. I can go to Ocean City, lay on the beach. I can go watch an Orioles game, a Ravens game. I can go crabbing. I can, I mean, I, I can go enjoy the bay. Uh, it's America Adventure. America and Minnesota. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Michael Sanderson, what's working well? I like to see a complicated <coughs> policy issue uh, get unstuck. Doesn't happen all that often, but I think we have a big issue in Maryland that might be going in that direction. Um, for a long time, 
public policy around drug abuse and uh, addiction and treatment and issues of that nature has kind of been bundled up with difficult politics. Uh, but I think in Maryland, sometime in the last year or two, this issue is kind of transcending. It's difficult in lots of communities across the state. We've got folks, um, we've got overdoses, uh, we've got uh, you know, polluted stuff getting into people's drug supply. Uh, we have kids who are in trouble. These are difficult challenges in just about every community. Mm -hmm. But what you need to tackle a tough issue like that responsibly is to get a lot of folks saying, this isn't just an inside the beltway problem. This isn't just a problem for someone other than me. It's there, it's here, it takes different shapes, but we need to be in it together. And I think the pieces are coming together for this as both a public health and a public safety and a, a citizen responsibility issue. You put all that together, there's the, Maryland is up to the challenge to, to do right by our citizens on a really tough issue there. I hope we're moving in the right direction. I'm Christine Osei. Uh, I'm going to speak directly to my county executive. <laughs> <laughs> I commend you for the work you're doing. I'm a longtime resident in the county. I live and work in the county for the last 26 years, Maryland Terrific. National Capital Park and Planning Commission. I love my community, love the county. This is the place I want to live. Great. But my question to you is, I asked a question earlier on charter schools. It's, it's close to my heart because I'm a mother. And as a, an urban planner, it really brings passion to me. The question is, I asked a question earlier, location of charter schools, not the curriculum. Somebody looks at a curriculum. Who is looking at the physical locations, the buildings in which these charter schools are going? If they're not going to go into traditional school environment, parochial schools that have closed and they can move in, if they're going to employment park, industrial park, commercial centers, shopping centers, who is looking at the standards that needs to be looked into before the curriculum is bought, lottery is run, children are already on the line to go, but the physical location is a challenge. Are we going to embrace curriculum and throw our kids in locations that are not really what we should be looking at? That is really one of my critical questions, and I'm glad you're here, that I can ask you because you're now in charge of your school board. Thank you. There are some drawbacks of doing that, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a, it's a critical question, and it's one that, quite honestly, in the county, we haven't had to face in the numbers we're facing now. I think the lieutenant governor talked about the number of charter schools in Prince George's County. Some have succeeded, some have failed. Um, the ones you see now, and you talk about, I think it's Chesapeake uh, Math uh, and Science in the northern part, in Laurel, that's in an industrial area. Really good charter school, something that uh, we embraced in the county, and you look at the College Park, Academy that's it's, uh, not far from here. The physical location, the physical structure of those, of, those, uh, of those schools is what when parents walk in, it's not traditional. The one in Laurel, I think, works because they work with the development over there. The one in, uh, in College Park, for example, um, and even some of the others, um, haven't physically been attractive, the environment. Um, just the same way in many of our schools, that's a big issue that we're going to tackle with the state is the physical environment of the schools. So who is looking at it? Well, the beauty of actually uh, being able to select a superintendent and president of the school board is you, we selected two individuals that get it and know that what we want is choice in Prince George's County and quality choice. Um, and so part of that is making sure when charter schools come online that we work with them to find locations and buildings that meet the needs of the teachers, the parents, and uh, the community. And so that's something we're working with them on. And, and um, I can say with, with certainty that uh, the leadership at the school gets it. We're going to work with them. One of the things that I've, I've done now that I have more responsibility in the uh, education arena is to put that on our uh, deputy county administrator for health, human services, and education. And, have, and I tour these uh, schools. So every, once a week, I find myself in a school as part of the promise I made as county executive, and that's all of our schools, both public schools and private schools and charter schools. So we'll be looking at that. Other comments, questions, diatribes, rants? <laughs> okay, right here. <laughs> 
Mic microphone's on its way. Hi, my name is Susan McComas, and I'm, I'm from the General Assembly. And I guess one thing that I'm from a small county, Harford County, we're always concerned about the formulas that are used because we don't seem to get as much money as Prince George's or Montgomery or Baltimore City. And, and I know the county executive's smiling because he knows that's true. Um, <laughs> so we really do have like two Marylands. We don't really have one Maryland, or we have a lot of different little Marylands. And I guess the question is, is what can we do or what... What do you see that can be done that can, you know, make things a little more an even playing field? Because we do not have the votes that can produce the money. Well, that's something that probably touches on all of you at one sure. point or another. Uh, who wants to go first? Matt? Want me to go? Sure. That's uh, an issue that we're facing. Uh, the the uh, most recent example was the pothole money distribution. Uh, Ten million dollars uh, was funded into this fiscal year uh, from the state and uh, we received about 300,000 of it for our, uh, for our county. Now, um, you look at our roads budget, uh, our roads budget used to be based on the highway user revenues. Uh, uh, it went from uh, I think over 10 million to about 400,000 total uh, to handle our roads in our county. Um, so while we appreciate the uh, money that was forwarded uh, by the pothole money, um, you know, for the potholes, for the winter damage, um, we're a long ways from being able to handle what we need to do. And that's one of the biggest um, threats that we face right now is severe infrastructure failure. Um, we, we cannot keep up with the roads that we have right now. Um, I don't know how we fix it. Um, the best thing, you know, one of my closing remarks is that what, you know, strengthening the relationship between the state and the county is more important now than ever, um, making sure that they understand the plight that we're in and uh, communicate that clearly. Um, other than that, it's, uh, I'm not sure what the best answer is. I think that uh, as much transparency as possible of how those calculations were derived uh, so that everyone uh, understands them. Uh, also, hopefully, that everyone would have a seat at the table. Um, you know, when we were going through our budget, we got about $554,000 for the pothole. Now, for me, I looked at it as almost like a Christmas gift. Uh, so we were ecstatic because we didn't see it coming. But uh, some municipal Howard County is a unique county because they don't have any uh, municipalities. I always found find that the counties are upset at the state and the municipalities are upset at the county because the counties don't give them the right calculations. Uh, we've strengthened our relationships with our municipalities. The first thing I did was reach out to the 12 municipalities and said, we just received $554,000 in additional pothole repair money. We want to share that with you. And we came up with calculations and shared it with our municipalities because we recognize our municipalities are our heartbeat of our county. So we laid it out very transparently of uh, knowledge of roads and showed them how we came up with those calculations. So. Uh, transparency is key, and then also making sure that everyone uh, has a seat at the table when that debate uh, happens to, to create those calculations. But the fact is, someone has to make a decision, and once that decision is made, uh, you have to go forward. Well, Sharon, how much uh, pothole money did Sam bring you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I said we, le we decriminalized pot, and we got pothole money. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> you know, Blaine's right. He's got 12. I was thinking, man, that's really nice. I wish I had 12. I have 27. Yeah. Um, but it is. I mean, we're a big county. We're 500 square miles. So um, it's when I was in the legislature, we used to have this all the time because we would complain in Prince George's County that we were not getting as much money as Baltimore City and Montgomery County. And we were the second largest jurisdiction and we should get more money. Um, when I became county executive, every part of this 500 square mile uh, county tells me we're not getting as much money as you put in the north or the central part because I live in the central. They think central gets the most money. Um, it, it really is. It, so what, what I think we have to do in order to really make this work, and it is a hard one to do, especially in a hard budget time. Um, I think the way to make it work is, is what we've tried at the at the local level, and that is you look at the needs of the county and you look at the needs of the state. What we prioritize our funding is in a program we call our Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative. 
those are six areas in Prince George's County where they're at the highest need, uh, whether it's education, you know, whether it's health disparity, lack of economic development opportunities. Those are the places that we actually take our limited funds and fund first. Now, you get complaints in some parts of our county, which are doing really well, and we're, we're a wealthy county. Um, but what we say to them, if we can rise those areas up, then everybody else will, will benefit. I think the, the, the issue with the state, and we go back and forth with our, and we're, you know, I'm guilty of this. I went and asked for a whole bunch of money for school construction. You know, I figured I've got you know, these schools that need to be built, and we've got a lot of students. But I think what the state has to do and what we have to work with them to do is look at the needs as, as a state as a whole, come in with our priorities from our various counties, and say, okay, here is our number one priority. Here's the main thing. We did this actually with our budget. We made each, we clustered the budgets, the, the agencies together, and we said, in that cluster, you guys have to come up with, so if it was, you know, Prince George's County, Montgomery County, and Anne Arundel County, we'd be in a room and say, okay, what is your priority? Mm -hmm. You guys all have to agree, the three of you. That becomes the number one priority for your region we're sending to the state. You in Baltimore region, what is your, you know, what is your priority? Something like that will at least make it uh, easier for Mike to do his job when he comes down there and says, here's what we want and doesn't have like, you know, a whole bunch of different philosophy. I think that's the only way to get it done. See, I have a, a unique uh, difference I forgot to mention. When I don't like the calculation, my father, Ron Young's a state senator. I can, I can pick up the phone and say, damn it, Dad, do a better job. <laughs> what are you doing down there? Oh, Michael? With, with, without wading into the big versus small issues and urban versus rural issues that are kind of peppered in here, I think in all candor, Delegate, you and your colleagues, you do yourselves a great disservice by calling all sorts of things you put in the budget aid. Aid is not a very powerful word. It sounds like you're cutting checks to commissioners and council members and executives to fritter around locally. You're investing in those roads, you're investing in those health departments, you're immunizing kids, you're putting cops on the street. Those things are powerful. Words like aid inevitably turn into spreadsheets with 24 rows, and everyone wants to compare county versus county and who got what. And then we start turning into a measuring contest of who are the winners and who are the losers. Um, this is back to my issue of philosophy. If the, if the state wants to make commitment to these programs, as opposed to formulas and distributions and winners and losers and so forth, that's the way out of this business of who are the winners. Let's focus on what needs to get done. Potholes. It's the local governments and these, your, your departments of public works who know where the potholes are. They're doing the right thing. State makes a commitment this is important to solve. This is going to be the worst year of potholes Maryland's ever seen. Let's get them fixed. You guys do it. Here's the cash. That's the right way to do it. Yeah, but you, if I can just add on just for a second. Because it might, I, I think what you have to do at the state level, though, is determine, and this is where the governor comes in, is determine what is the philosophy, what is going to be the policy that the, the governor president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of the state. Because that's going to drive your priorities and that's going to drive your funding. So if you say our, our philosophy is that, you know, the number one thing is to grow business. Then you look across the state and you say, where is the best chance for us to either retain businesses, increase the businesses we have, or attract businesses to our area? And then you start investing there. Education. You know, if you look at the needs of Prince George's County and our rural uh, brothers and sisters, it's almost the same because in our county, we, even though we're wealthy, we have pockets of, of poverty. We have rural areas where you can't really, you know, you, you, get, you, know you, you have the same challenges. But if the state says that's our priority is, is education, then you put that in there. And it makes it easier for us as a county to go to the state and say, okay, we understand what your, what your priority is. Here's what we have that meets that. Mm -hmm. And here's where you can help us meet our needs. And I think that helps us. Right now, it's a buckshot. You know, we go in with our priorities, and we have to guess what the state, you know, because the state is not just the governor. It's the Speaker of the House and is the President of the Senate. You know, this whole issue of rural-urban, if you saw the <laughs> April issue of uh, governing, that is our cover, uh, you know, yep. and, and we're going to be paying a lot of attention to it. Obviously, Maryland is not alone 
in that uh, you know, I spent 23 years in Missouri, and there's a world of difference between outstate Missouri and St. Louis and Kansas City. Uh, you know, and uh, sometimes you, they are foreign countries. Uh, you know, it's, uh, so, you know, and it, it makes an interesting challenge for, for elected officials in those states, and, and we look at that. So I just want you to know, you're, you're in a boat that has a lot of other folks in it uh, as, as we're going forward. Other comments, questions? Yes, back here. Good morning. Good this morning. is for my county executive, um, uh, Mr. Baker. Um, I'm actually um, Prince George's clean energy organizer. And I would like to know, what is your platform and your commitment to cl uh, renewable clean energy um, within our county as, as well as um, pushing it up to the state uh, legislature? Also, mm -hmm. been hearing a lot about, um, of course, the energy sector, environmental sector, you know, jobs are coming, jobs are coming. Can you please give me the hard facts? Where are they? <laughs> I, I mean, really, because people are looking for them. Where are the jobs? Are they coming? Are they here? Where do people find them? Those two. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're sitting right next to Stephanie Maxwell. She can tell you where the jobs are. <laughs> um, but let me, let, let me ask you, I, we're really committed to um, the green economy, so much so that we actually changed um, an agency in Prince George's County. We actually moved, it used to be the Department of Environment, Re, Environmental Resources. Um, we actually made it the Department of Environment to focus on, one, what's going on with um, uh, renewable energy, what's going on with uh, the environment, what's going, what, how can we work with the state and with the federal government for two very good reasons. Uh, one is, well, three very good reasons. One is good for the environment. Uh, two, there are jobs that are going to be created out of those, and we want those jobs to come to Prince George's County. We think we're in a great place. And three, there are federal funding that's, that's out there. Um, so our director, Adam Ortiz, has been really working hard and bringing in some of the best folks uh, uh, around, around the country. Once again, we're, we're lucky, as the, the Governor Glendenny is sitting out there, um, he actually put, it, put a lot of these things in place when he was county executive. And we're just really highlighting them. So we're, we're, we're working very good uh, on that. And I, and I ask you to you know, go and look at um, the things that are going on in our department and environment under Adam Ortiz. The jobs. I mean, that's the number one thing for us. Um, in Prince George's County, the biggest issue we have is 70% um, you know, of our tax revenues come from property taxes. Um, we have got to change that. I can't increase property taxes. I'm sure my colleagues can so I've got to grow our commercial tax base and grow our jobs. The jobs are coming. You know, we're building a, a regional a medical center here in Prince George's County at Largo Metro Station uh, with the idea that it's not. So everything we do is based on the creation of jobs and businesses in the county. So the medical center is not just providing great health. It's also creating uh, medical jobs and, and using it as a, as a catalyst. The Destination Resort Casino. It's not just about table games and, and slot machines. It, it's about entertainment and being able to have a pipeline of training uh, for folks who, once it's built, uh, can work there, but also uh, the construction jobs that go along with it. So they are coming. But the problem is, and I'm sure we all face this, it's not coming fast enough. And the state doesn't have enough resources to help us through those periods. So what we have to do is two things. One, continue to work hard. But three, we've got to make sure that, you know, and I'll just speak for Prince George's County, I've got to make sure that the residents and the businesses of Prince George's County are prepared to take advantage of those opportunities that come. It would be a shame if we build, we get the FBI, which is a $2 billion project to come to Greenbelt, and none of the businesses or residents can help with the expansion of that or the creation of it. So we're working very hard to make sure that they're, um, there is training and there's opportunities there. So the, the environment issue is, is one of the things that uh, sometimes sort of uh, exacerbates the rural urban thing, but Matt, you talked a little bit about uh, some good stuff happening mm -hmm. in the environment in your county. Sure. Uh, how, how, do, how do you react to this question? Well, one thing I can talk about uh, renewable energy, um, and we've been very publicly looking into a uh, waste energy facility in our county. 
um, we have a common issue with a lot of our surrounding counties and that our landfills are filling up. Yep. And I, for one, have never been a proponent of burying our trash in the ground and trying to forget about it. So uh, we have looked into first establishing a material recovery facility, a MRF, um, which will then hopefully lead into uh, a waste to energy facility. Uh, we're looking at a bunch of different options, and we hopefully will have an RFP out here uh, soon for a public-private partnership. Um, so private uh, business could come in, set it up for us. We'd provide the land and the feedstock. Again, it goes back to my um, asking that we uh, approach things on a regional issue, um, or, a re or you know, look at it, look at it regionally. Um, I think that this could be a regional answer that could uh, take care of the whole Lower Eastern Shore in one facility and, and really solve a lot of problems. The, um, the, the idea of, of regional is another thing that I would just tell you as we do these events across the country and so forth, uh, whether we're in California or Texas or Georgia or Michigan, that, that, that word, you know, regional, regional scale, regional cooperation, regional collaboration, uh, you're not alone there either. That, that is probably one of the central challenges of government today. We sort of designed and built our jurisdictional lines in our government in the uh, 18th and 19th century for mm -hmm. a different world mm -hmm. than, than we have today. Other comments or questions? Can I talk a little bit about the, the waste? Sure, yeah, absolutely. We have an Office of Sustainability, uh, Sustainability Commission, very, very popular. Uh, we get more applications uh, for that now than any other commission. The uh, Planning Commission was always the popular one people wanted to sit on, and now no one wants to sit on. <laughs> we're, we're, we're the county everyone wants to move to, and once they move there, they don't want anyone else to come. Uh, and uh, we deal with that a lot. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we, we truck uh, 90 to 92 percent of our trash out of the county every day. Only 8 percent of our trash goes in our landfill. Since year 2000, we've now spent over $80 million uh, trucking our trash out of the county. Uh, many boards of commissioners, and by the way, this is the last board of commissioners, and I'm the last board president ever in the history of Frederick County because we'll, we'll transform now to charter government and how to have a county executive and a county council. So we're, 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 that diversity, that transformation in Frederick County is happening. Uh, but we, we already have the permits in hand for a waste energy facility. Uh, we need a partner. So, if any of you two, uh, <laughs> I can, we, we can do it on a napkin. Uh, but uh, but we're, we are trying to build a waste energy facility. Uh, we had a partner in Carroll County. They've decided uh, that they don't want to go forward anymore. Uh, so, we are looking uh, in terms of, of, of finding uh, a partner for that solution. I mean, my grandfather always said, the things that I will worry about is water. And he'd roll over in his grave if he ever do. I paid $2 for a bottle of water. Uh, trash and uh, energy, mm -hmm. and uh, you know those are going to be the problems of the next generation and the generation mm -hmm. after that. So we're trying to tackle them in Frederick County. Water, trash, and energy. You heard it here. <laughs> yes, back there. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Aaron Barker. I work for the Department of Budget and Management. And um, drawing on the Lieutenant Governor's comments about in uh, inequality in the state, his closing comments. What do you see as the leading cause of poverty in each of your counties. What are you doing to address it and how do we address it better as a state? Who wants to go first on that one? Mr. Oh. Baker, we'll start oh. with you. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, well, for us, I mean, we're right next to the District of Columbia and um, uh, it's jobs. It's, it's a number of folks that go searching for um, you know, the, with the economy turning down, uh, a lot of the construction and building jobs, you know, when, when, it, when it turns down, in, 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 especially inside the Beltway in Prince George's County, if there are lack of job opportunities in the District of Columbia, it has a disproportionate effect of, on us in Prince George's County because many of our folks work in, in the district. Um, many of our businesses have contract with the federal government, and so during that shutdown, you couldn't hire more people. So it's, it's folks who don't have employment. And then there are those chronic problems that we've had. Um, like I said, we're, we're a wealthy county with pockets of poverty. Um, so the, the economy only exacerbated that. Um, you know, how to solve it. Um, 
that's what we're looking at right now. That's why, for us, our Transforming Neighborhoods initiative is so important. Because now, for the first time, we've identified in those areas, not just based on, um, based on poverty from the sense that, you know, uh, free and reduced lunch in, in schools, but lack of job opportunities in these areas, lack of transportation to get the jobs elsewhere, and lack of quality health care, because health care has a huge impact on it. Um, so the way to solve it is at the local and state level, to get the state to buy into the fact that we've identified where our needs are, and we've come up with a plan on how to address it over a long haul, which is what it's going to take, and we need you to help us in that. Um, so that would be, you know, and get something that I deal with every day, and we'll Matt Holloway, poverty in New York County and what to do about it? Same thing, jobs. Um, we used to be a large uh, manufacturing uh, county. A lot of those businesses uh, left, um, not just because, not, not because of anything we did, but just changing times. Uh, we have one that is uh, closing soon that was a uh, paper company, um, printing. And, uh, you know, that's, a lot of that's going out now. Um, so what we're hoping to do is to refocus uh, instead of trying to necessarily attract the large uh, manufacturers, uh, try to do like a grassroots entrepreneurial um, a a attack at it. Um, we have money in the budget this year um, that's been presented by the executive for uh, entrepreneurial um, incubator um, to try to work with Salisbury University, with Warwick, um, to try to attract these uh, graduates from um, colleges, what they call them, the millennials, try to attract the millennials uh, to stay here, to create the jobs, um, raise the families, you know, bring the business and, and grow it from people that are existing here rather than try to attract the Rolls-Royce and the, and the other uh, manufacturing businesses. And, um, you know, we have a lot more opportunity the way I see it with the number of college graduates we have coming out than uh, a lot more opportunities there than trying to attract just the big name um, to come into our county. Gotcha. Yeah. Blaine Young, causes of poverty and what to do about it in your county? Uh, education, 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 uh, access, uh, accessibility, um, and, and you got to have some hope in there too in terms of, you know, you've got to make it, uh, if, if someone's a single mom and they've got three kids, who's going to watch the kids if they want to go to Frederick Community College or if they want to go into one of the satellite campuses and get their degree at Frostburg State uh, University in Frederick County. So. Uh, affordability, access, uh, and then obviously, you know, we want each of us want our counties to be as friendly as possible to the private sector so they can thrive and the jobs are there. Uh, but everybody uh, that does not have a job should want one. So there's a balance that you don't want to make uh, too much uh, help available when they, that that drive goes away. Uh, but those that want one should be able to have the ability to get one and get what education they would need, whether it's at the community college level, whether it may be uh, some type of training, uh, going to, to a nursing school that's at our community college. Uh, and then we can't forget about uh, the technical trades and the construction trades of people wanting to, whether it's to be drywall, brick mason, uh, electrician, plumbers. When I talk to a lot of those industries, they don't see a lot of, uh, of the... the, the the young kids coming out saying, I want to be a plumber. Plumbers make pretty good money. But here at the same time is, again, they've got to have that path. Well, I want to be a plumber. I work for a plumbing company. But I'm going to go to FCC and get my two-year degree in business because one day I may want to be an entrepreneur and open my own plumbing company. So we've got to make sure that that hope, the sky is always the limit. You could be the owner. You could be the entrepreneur. But at the same time, what is that path to get there? And how difficult is that journey going to be? Uh, and that's where I think the role of government comes in to make sure that that accessibility and affordability is there. If not, some people just give up. Michael, look at across at all the counties. I think the reason questions like this are so vexing, even for a panel as esteemed as my colleagues here, is there's no easy answer. So it's got to be all of the above. It's got to be jobs. It's got to be opportunity. It's got to be education. And, and you do everything you can on all those fronts. There's a reason this is a, a national priority, a national concern. And this state's very concerned about it, too. And I think uh, my county colleagues and their colleagues across the state feel the same way. This is a, it's a real serious issue. Okay. We're coming to the end here. Uh, 
really quick, one minute each, what's your final takeaway you'd like to leave these folks with? Um, I, I guess for me, it's, uh, you know, and I'll do it from the Prince George's perspective. I and mean, we feel really good about where we're going. Um, we feel good about the fact that we're putting things in place that are going to create the type of um, job opportunities uh, for the county. We're, we're building on our um, uh, proximity to the District of Columbia and, and our metro sites and creating those opportunities. Health care for us is elevated. Um, and, and so uh, and public safety is, is, is going in the right direction. So what, what I would leave with you is by having a focus agenda on where, where you want the outcomes to be in, in uh, four to eight years, uh, you can start achieving those. I mean, we set goals for ourselves in attracting businesses to the county so they could hire more people, uh, funding our education system so the people who are here can be trained and take those jobs. Um, so I feel good about where we're going as a county. Um, like we, uh, I'd like to say a lot is, uh, and I'll leave it with this panel, um, you know, Prince George's County is the place to be. <laughs> you know, I think um, we are moving in the right direction. The relationship between uh, the executive and legislative branch of our county and our municipality, Salisbury in particular, has never been stronger. Um, so with that working relationship, we can accomplish a lot. And I don't want to come off as a... Uh, ungrateful child of the state up here complaining about the things that the state has taken away from us. Um, we are dependent on the state for many things. Um, and, and I think, as I said before, now more than ever, our relationship with the state is critical. And uh, we need to do what we can to work on that and make sure that they understand uh, the plight that we're in. Uh, from, a, I guess, a different perspective, uh, you know, if you got good health, appreciate it. It's something that a lot of people take for granted. Uh, and you don't know what it's like until you're sick. So when you're sick, you want to be better. So if you got good health, be thankful. Always find the positive in everything. There's enough negative to go around for everybody. Uh, pick up the paper, turn on the TV. So find a positive uh, in everything. And uh, make a list, or at the end of the day, always ask yourself, what did I accomplish? Because whether it's small, medium, or large, it always makes you feel good when you accomplish something. Michael? I, I think it, it's, it's great that this conversation is ending on a positive note three times over. And just a political observation, Maryland, through our governance structure and folks from some decades ago, decided the voters get to have their say on an awful lot of this in a four-year cycle. And this is that year. So we have, uh, whatever happens uh, this year, uh, we're going to have an awful lot of new people in county government, an awful lot of new people in the state legislature and in the state house who will be able to seize that optimism, seize these opportunities, and make some of the decisions we've been talking about. Okay, what are the ne what's the next play for Maryland at each of these levels? So, if you've got room for optimism, we got a whole new team coming aboard. A lot of them are going to look to hit the ground running. You can do that. All right, the Honorable Rashawn Baker, the Honorable Matt Holloway the Honorable Blaine Young, and Executive Director Michael Sanderson. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.